Can I thank the Minister and members for their contributions. The next item of business is a statement by Rosanna Cunningham on the Greenhouse Gas Inventory 2014. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement. I would appreciate if all questions were as concise as possible and possibly even the statement too. I call on the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In 2009, this Parliament unanimously passed the Climate Change Act, establishing Scotland as a world leader in tackling one of the defining challenges of our time. The Act set out an ambitious long-term target to reduce Scottish greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050, relative to the 1990 baseline. It also contains an interim 2020 target for a 42% reduction and annual targets for each year. The latest official statistics on Scottish greenhouse gas emissions covering 2014 were published this morning. I would like to update Parliament on these figures, what they mean in terms of progress towards our existing targets, and also set out our next steps in developing new and even more ambitious targets. Presiding officer, these statistics show that Scotland is making outstanding progress in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Not only has the annual target for 2014 been met, but we have exceeded the level of our interim 2020 target six years early. For the purpose of target reporting, Scottish emissions in 2014 were down by 12.5% from 2013 and down by 45.8% from baseline levels. Over this period, reductions in emissions have been delivered in every sector, including energy supply, homes, transport, waste management, business and industry, and agriculture. The new figures also show that Scotland has yet again outperformed the UK as a whole in reducing emissions. Comparisons to other Western European EU 15 countries are not yet available for 2014, but as of the previous year, only Sweden had delivered greater reductions. The science of measuring and reporting on greenhouse gas emissions is complicated, but I can assure members that we have met our targets as the result of real progress in reducing actual Scottish emissions. As in previous years, today's statistics reflect ongoing improvements to the science of how emissions are accounted for. However, even without such revisions, both the annual 2014 and interim 2020 targets would still have been met. The 2014 figures should also be seen in the context of Scotland's strong long-term progress, which has been acknowledged by a range of independent experts. Lord Devon, the chair of the Committee on Climate Change, has said that Scotland is leading the UK in its ambitious approach and is to be commended for doing so. And Christiana Figueres, head of the UN climate body, has described our approach as being exemplary. While emission statistics provide the big picture, what really matters, of course, are the real world, everyday changes, large and small, that underpin this. I want to provide some examples of the transformative changes occurring across Scotland. On energy efficiency, the Scottish Government's record investment is being reflected in big improvements to Scotland's housing. The share of homes rated EPC band C and above has increased by 71% since 2010 and by 11% in the last year. Our efforts are helping to reduce emissions and also tackle fuel poverty by making homes warmer and more affordable to heat while supporting low carbon jobs and regenerating communities. On renewables, I join the Minister for Business, Innovation and Energy in welcoming the announcement that construction on the £2.6 billion Beatrice offshore wind farm will commence later this year. Scotland's early adoption of clean green energy technology and infrastructure means that renewables are now Scotland's biggest electricity generator. Projects such as Beatrice will also help to deliver a wide range of employment 
and community benefits. The Scottish Government's 2020 target for 500 megawatts of local and community-owned renewable energy capacity has also been delivered five years early. This has been independently estimated to be worth up to £2.2 billion to the Scottish economy over those projects' lifetime. On transport, we are determined to free Scotland's towns, cities and communities from damaging vehicle emissions by 2050 with significant progress by 2030. Adequate provision of refuelling infrastructure will be key. The Charge Place Scotland network now comprises over 550 publicly available electric vehicle charge points, including over 140 rapid chargers, making it one of Europe's most comprehensive networks. This forms part of the Scottish Government's annual investment of over £1 billion in public and sustainable transport. Since 2008, over 550 Scottish communities have been supported by the Climate Challenge Fund to address climate change and make the move to low carbon living. We are committed to retaining that fund and sharpening its focus. Presiding officer, under this government, Scotland has delivered significant reductions in greenhouse gas emissions through initiatives like these and many other actions. Whilst delighted by this progress, I'm in no way complacent regarding the scale of the challenge ahead. But I am also excited by the scope of the opportunity before us. This is an especially important time for climate change in light of the international agreement reached in Paris last December. The agreement represents the first time that all countries have joined in recognising the scale of the challenge and agreeing the route we need to take. As the Scottish Government hoped and argued for, the Paris Agreement has raised global ambition. It must now serve as a call to action for all governments. Ours is no exception, and we will heed that call. This Government intends to raise still further our ambition on climate change and to continue to lead the world in the transition to a low-carbon economy. That is why the First Minister has already confirmed our plan to establish a new and more testing 2020 target. Our manifesto also included a commitment to improve the transparency and accountability of our targets by basing them directly on actual Scottish emissions. And we're committed to setting emission reduction targets based on the best available evidence and expert independent advice. Presiding officer, I can advise the chamber that I'm writing to the Committee on Climate Change today, seeking their advice on Scotland's future targets in response to the Paris Agreement. These ambitious new targets will serve as a statutory impetus to further action. Delivery will require coordinated approaches across portfolios and the reflection of climate change considerations at the very highest level of this government. In this context, I can also announce that the Cabinet Subcommittee on Climate Change has been reconstituted. And just as we must work across government on this vital issue, so we should engage across Parliament. I've already begun to meet with party spokespeople and I'm keen to offer regular cross-party roundtables during this Parliament to discuss progress and share ideas and information. Now, one of the Cabinet Subcommittee's first tasks will be to develop the Scottish Government's next emissions reduction plan, the third report on proposals and policies. I intend to lay a draft of RPP3 before Parliament before the end of the year. This Government understands that tackling climate change requires action, not only from the public sector, but also from businesses, charities and individuals. We will capture this through the participation process for RPP3. Climate change is, of course, a global challenge, and other countries must step up and match our ambition and action. In particular, recent UK government policy reversals on renewable energy and energy efficiency stand in stark contrast to the scale of Scotland's vision. The UK government will also bring forward an emissions reduction plan this year. We need the UK to support Scotland's drive to develop renewables and carbon capture and storage, not stymie it as they have done over this past year. And both myself and my Cabinet colleagues will take every opportunity through our engagement with UK Ministers to make the case to reverse recent decisions. To conclude, Presiding Officer, the statistics published this morning are excellent news for Scotland and for everyone who lives here. They show that through the drive and determination of this Government and by the actions of people, communities, organisations and businesses all around the country, we have met the 2014 emissions reduction target and exceeded the 2020 target for a 42% reduction six years ahead of schedule. We set ourselves a high bar 
and are showing by our deeds as well as our words that Scotland can indeed lead the world. Our progress provides a strong platform upon which to build. But there's more to do, and the advice we receive from the Committee on Climate Change will inform our next steps, as will the deliberations of the Cabinet subcommittee. Presiding Officer, this Government remains absolutely committed to tackling climate change and to delivering the bold actions needed to meet our targets. I hope all members will welcome the progress shown in today's statistics and support our next steps. Thank you. We now have questions. I would ask all members to press their request to, beat and sp request to speak button, if you wish to be called, and Maurice Golden first. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you, new, uh, Cabinet Secretary, for the advanced copy of the Ministerial Statement. While I welcome that the targets have been met after four years of missed targets, I'm dismayed that overall this is a result of accounting changes rather than of attributable actions by the Scottish Government. Stop Climate Chaos Scotland has said it is hard to see the fingerprint of Scottish Government policy. For example, business and industry emissions have fallen by 39.6% since 1990, but crucially most of this reduction was before the Scottish Climate Act was passed in 2009. Will the Scottish Government be willing to go beyond a 50% reduction by 2020, as we predict this will be met anyway, as well as, crucially and critically, set sector-specific targets for waste, buildings and transport? Cabinet Secretary. Oh dear. Um, you know, we have just uh, announced uh, fantastic news for Scotland. Great statistics on greenhouse gas emissions. And I would have hoped for a slightly more enthusiastic response uh, from uh, the Conservatives uh, this afternoon. The truth is that opposition parties, including the Conservatives, have stood in this chamber lambasting the government when it failed to meet the targets. Now we have met the targets. It seems to me that the Conservatives do need to rise a little uh, to that challenge. And that's a challenge for the Conservatives themselves. I've indicated in my statement that there are significant things holding us back that emanate from the Conservative government in Westminster. And I would hope that the Conservatives in Scotland are able to bring some pressure to bear on their colleagues down south. As for increasing the targets, I indicated that we are willing to do so. We have talked of a target of more than 50% by 2020, but I'm sure the uh, member will not be surprised uh, to hear that I want to take uh, evidence on this. I want to have very serious discussions about this and I want to be able to set targets that are realistic and achievable and we will do so. But we have that commitment to say more than 50%. Can I say, presiding officer, we were the only party going into the last election that had any such commitment in its manifesto. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, presiding officer, and thanks to the cabinet secretary for advance notice of the statement. Um, I welcome the announcement. The government has indeed met its targets today and the 2020 targets have been met as well. It would help if the Cabinet Secretary could clarify about the EET scheme boost that some NGOs have highlighted as, as contributing to that. Uh, the, uh, the point I want to make is about the RPP3 and how the uh, Committee on Climate Change has stressed uh, that there will need to be a significant strengthening of policies. And I hope the Cabinet Secretary will um, agree with that, particularly across those heavy emitters, and that research is absolutely vital for the future to ensure that challenged communities are not excluded and that the right transferable skills are developed, along with unions, businesses, and the education sector, to bring new jobs. Cabinet Secretary. I thank Claudia Beamish and she, she raises uh, um, some important points there about the engagement that is going to be required right across the board uh, in order to move us forward from where we are, um, but also to recognise that there are big gains from what we're doing uh, and, uh, and those gains will accrue to uh, um, many of the sectors as well that she's, uh, she's talked about. Now, she did ask about the, um, the factors that have allowed us to get to where we are um, this year, there, there are basically um, three main factors. Uh, one is that um, there is a reduction in emissions at source. Um, 
Uh, the largest reductions were in energy supply in the residential sector, so that, does, that, that is a factor in this. Um, yes, there's an adjustment to reflect Scotland's share of the uh, EU emissions trading systems allowance. It's in line with legislation that adjustment is required for recording progress against targets. And the method of calculation has remained exactly the same as in 2013. So we're not moving away in any way from what, uh, um, uh, uh, what was used uh, last year. And the other thing is that the greenhouse gas inv inventory has been revised downwards in the latest year. Uh, despite that, previous upward revisions mean that the baseline level of emissions remains higher by 10% than was the case in 2009. And this means that the present fixed annual target is still tougher than was envisaged when it was set. So we are moving forward on all fronts. And I hope that members in the chamber will be able to uh, acknowledge uh, and endorse that movement. Angus MacDonald. Thank you, uh, President Officer. I very much welcome the announcement by the Cabinet Secretary that the Cabinet Subcommittee on Climate Change is being reconstituted. I think it's fair to say we saw the benefits of that subcommittee during the, the last session of Parliament. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide any more detail on the subcommittee's role and membership? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I thank the member for the question. Um, as Scotland's first dedicated Cabinet Secretary for the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, um, I will in fact uh, be chairing this subcommittee. His membership will include the Cabinet Secretaries for uh, the Rural Economy and Connectivity, uh, Finance and the Constitution and Economy, Jobs and Fair Work, as well as the Ministers for Business, Innovation and Energy, Transport on the Islands and Local Government and Housing. Um, one of the subcommittee's first tasks will be to develop the Scottish Government's next emissions reduction plan, the third report on uh, proposals uh, and uh, policies. And, uh, the subcommittee will uh, meet in due course and discuss its remit uh, at its first meeting. I, I would be happy to outline the remit to an, uh, uh, in an update to the Parliament's Environment Committee later this year. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can, and can I also thank the Cabinet Secretary for the advance copy of her statement. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, given the poor performance of energy efficiency in contributing to climate change targets, and notwithstanding the modest improvements which we welcome, will the Scottish Government agree with the Scottish Conservatives that transformational action is still required, which means increasing the energy efficiency budget to 10% of the capital budget, creating a £1 billion investment by 2020? Um, I've just had whispered into my ear from my colleague, uh, the Minister for Business, Innovation and Energy, uh, that it would be timely to remind the Chamber of the um, Westminster Government pulling the plug on the Green Deal, what, just a year ago? So um, discussions about energy efficiency uh, are very relevant, very important, but let's not forget that we are doing so in a much bigger context uh, as well. Energy efficiency is a priority for the Scottish Government. Um, it's been designated a national infrastructure priority in recognition of its importance. Uh, the cornerstone of this will be Scotland's en energy efficiency programme. And in January, we announced that up to £14 million is available to support pilots to integrate actions on domestic and non-domestic energy efficiency. We expect awards to be made in this month. Uh, we're also giving early consideration to how we can use new powers over the warm homes discount and energy company uh, obligation and aim to consult on proposals later this year and the member might be interested in following up when that consultation uh, takes place. Um, there is also a short life fuel poverty strategic working group and rural fuel poverty task force I know the member will be interested in. They will report their recommendations by the end of this year and that will help us in terms of uh, programme uh, development um, and uh, uh, I, I think uh, uh, what I hope uh, uh, that people will accept is that uh, this government is completely committed in difficult financial times, uh, uh, nevertheless, to driving this particular aspect of policy forwards. Stuart Stevenson to be followed by David Stewart. Um, may I express enormous gratitude for all those who've contributed to the possibility that I may not be a 104-year-old uh, when we meet the 2050 target of 80%, but instead be 84-year-old, and I may survive that long. But it's clear that the change of policy by the UK government 
uh, on renewables will have a real impact on our ability to get there. Can the Minister now, or at a later date, give us some quantitative indication as to how much more difficult the changing of renewable support by the UK Government makes our ability to meet this target in the bill which I was greatly honoured to take through Parliament in 2008 and 9. Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, the UK Government has indeed made a number of policy decisions uh, which have potentially serious impact on our own climate change ambitions. And I've obviously made some reference to that uh, already uh, this afternoon. The early closure of the renewables obligation for large-scale onshore wind and solar PV projects, um, cutting support for small-scale renewable projects through the feed-in tariffs, uh, we're also seeing an impact in investor confidence through delays and uncertainty in contracts for difference. The UK Government's Department for Energy and Climate Change have conducted their own impact assessment on the early closure of the renewables obligation. Uh, this estimated that the UK could lose up to 63 megatons of additional source emissions. To put that in context, that is the equivalent to more than a year's worth of Scotland's entire emissions. Now, in Scotland, we've made clear our ambitions to create uh, a low uh, carbon energy future while keeping the lights on and keeping consumer bills low. But to achieve these three ambitions in the absence of subsidies, we do need a mechanism to stabilise the market to ensure investment in our more cost-effective low carbon technologies. David Stewart, followed by Mark Ruskell. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be well aware that transport is still a major source of climate change emissions. In my view, there are two areas for future improvement. Firstly, taking freight off the roads onto rail and sea, and secondly, developing low emission zones. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that the Freight Facilities Grant has been unspent over the last four years? And finally, what assessment has been made of the effect on low emission zones will have on future climate change emissions? Cabinet Secretary. I thank the member for his question, which uh, might have been more helpfully directed to uh, um, the Transport Minister. Um, we do, as a government, increase investment in sustainable transport, um, supporting work around modal shift to active and public transport, and uh, rail and water transport for freight. So um, we are very committed to that, as well as new technologies which will make the actual uh, emissions uh, of vehicles um, more efficient. And we're investing over £1 billion per year in public and sustainable transport. Um, there is, uh, I think, since 2012, £11 million spent on the electric network, uh, electricity network that I've talked about in terms of electric vehicles. I have a very uh, keen constituent uh, in respect of this. Um, and uh, I think that uh, uh, um, the, the, the transport part of the entire process is one of the most challenging, and I don't think any of us doubt that. And one of the reasons it is the most challenging is, of course, it is one of the ones that's hardest to get people's behavior to change around. Um, I will endeavor uh, uh, to establish the detail uh, uh, answer that uh, uh, no doubt the member was hoping for. Um, I'm sorry that I'm not able to give it uh, this afternoon, uh, but I will have the Minister uh, for Transport write directly to him on this. Mark Ruskell to be followed by Finlay Carson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance a copy of the statement and also to her commitment here today to reconvene the Cabinet Subcommittee. I do hope there will be opportunities for opposition spokespeople to engage with that subcommittee. I can also welcome the release of these figures today, but it's clear that quirks in accounting, warm weather, wind farms and recycling have finally resulted in a met target after five years. It is hard to see how Scottish Government policy has delivered much of this progress and of course we still have much to do on transport and housing. So will the Cabinet Secretary commit today to a real terms increase in climate change funding year on year for the lifetime of this Parliament and also will she commit to a scrapping of the climate wrecking policy to slash uh, passenger duty? Secretary. Well, um, the member raises uh, a, a number of issues there, not least of which the list of things that have contributed to the fact that we have now met our targets. But, you know, um, eventually, when our target was met, there would be a list of things that actually uh, allowed us to achieve the target. And, and it doesn't seem to me to be reasonable to discount the things that have been done simply uh, because the target has now been met. Uh, and I, I noticed that the... Uh, um, the, the member referenced uh, uh, warm weather uh, or 
mild winters. I do remember some very seriously cold winters, but I don't recall the government getting uh, any credit uh, for the, uh, where we'd got to in terms of targets dealing with the very cold winters. So it can't really have it both ways. All of this contributes over the longer term, and that surely is what this was all about. Uh, and that's uh, uh, what, we, uh, uh, what we want to see. Now, in terms of funding, there were some very serious uh, impacts in terms of uh, uh, funding uh, that were brought about by changes made by the Westminster government. And uh, I think that uh, 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 some of that has, has caused difficulty. There were cuts to the climate change budget lines predominantly as a consequence of changes made by the UK government in the rolling back of their green policies. Um, the UK government has slashed renewable support, as I've already indicated. All of this has an impact uh, on us as well. Um, without the UK hampering us in this way, we would be seeing a £13.3 million overall increase in our budgets, budgets supporting climate change. Um, the issue of uh, APD is uh, understandably one which has been raised by a number of people. Uh, we are showing uh, global leadership by including both domestic and international aviation in our emissions reduction targets. Uh, there are, of course, important environmental issues. We're working with environmental groups. We've consulted on the proposed scope and methodology of a strategic environmental assessment, which will be carried out later uh, this year. Um, and uh, when we have uh, 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 looked at all of that, um, we will take a balanced approach on this matter in recognition of the wider negative economic impacts that UK APD has on the Scottish economy. Finlay Carson, to follow, followed by Lee MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer, and thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for the advance notice of the report. Given that agriculture and land use accounts for 23.4% of Scotland's emissions, and given the slow progress of the biorefinery roadmap, will the Scottish Government commit to invest in biorefining as the best method of dealing with our biomass waste? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I looked into the issue of biorefining, but I'm always somewhat uh, um, uh, uh, interested in uh, Conservative calls for more spending. Um, it's not their usual uh, position. Uh, I'm uh, uh, glad, however, that uh, uh, Finlay Carson has referenced the issue of agriculture in this. Uh, we are making some progress in terms of uh, agriculture emissions, and I, I think what needs to be said is that right across all the sectors, progress has been made. Um, that's uh, uh, very important. Emissions from agriculture and related use have fallen 25% since 1990. Um, it, we've, we've done a number of things over the years, including investing a huge amount of money in the beef efficiency scheme, which no doubt Finlay Carson is well aware of, um, uh, which will help thousands of herds to become uh, more efficient. Um, and we are introducing uh, other uh, things as well. Net emissions... Uh, from the agriculture and related land use sector have seen a gradual decline from 98 to 2014 uh, linked to the impact of historic changes in land use, change to cropland and grassland and also a decline in cattle and sheep numbers and we do expect that decline to continue. Lee MacArthur to be followed by Graham Day. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of our statement and warmly welcome uh, the achievements of the targets announced in the statement. Uh, of course, the Cabinet Secretary was right to point to the challenge now to, to sustain and accelerate the momentum. Uh, in that light, and given what you said about the difficulty to, in transport of changing behaviours, does she believe that Scottish Government uh, policy or proposals to slash air passenger, air passenger duty will help reduce transport emis emissions, which themselves have only reduced by 2.8% uh, since 1990? Exactly. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not entirely sure whether or not the member... Uh, can I welcome his welcoming of the, of the figures first? But I wasn't entirely sure there whether he was questioning me about the overall issue of APD or APD in respect of Scottish Government activities. Um, uh, I, I did um, respond to uh, Mark Ruskell uh, on the wider issue of APD. Um, I uh, basically um, uh, believe that uh, uh, there is a balanced kind of decision has to be made here. Um, we are making uh, that decision uh, with as much care uh, as we can. Um, there, are, there is quite an interesting kind of uh, um, uh, truth, though, which is that the, the EU ETS adjustment process 
um, means that actually changes in terms of APD wouldn't necessarily make much difference uh, in counting emissions towards our overall targets. So there's, there, is a, there is an interesting interplay there in the way the stats are actually brought together that uh, is quite complicated, as I'm discovering, but is nevertheless the case. Graham Day. Thank you. The very welcome figures released today indicate that changes in public behaviour are beginning to have a positive impact on reducing carbon emissions, at least in some areas. But how will the Scottish Government seek to ensure that this behavioural change spreads to others, such as heat, transport and land use? And does the Cabinet Secretary agree with WDOF Scotland that changing public behaviour in these areas must be at the heart of achieving further significant reductions in Scotland's carbon emissions? Cabinet Secretary. Of course, you know, changing individual behaviour, public behaviour, um, is the key to unlocking quite a lot of this. Um, we, we did see quite a, a big drop in uh, emissions from residential uh, establishments, um, which we suspect is because of people heeding the advice to turn down their, uh, their central heating, which of course gives them the benefit of lower fuel bills, but nevertheless cumulatively across the whole of Scotland begins to impact on overall emissions. And there's an example of, of how it can be a win-win if it's approached in the right way. But the member is right to raise that issue more widely. Um, today's figures do provide us with a platform on which to build for the future, um, but we'll only succeed in achieving our climate change ambitions if we do take the people of Scotland with us. So understanding and influencing how they act is key. And I think Claudia Beamish was uh, getting to some of that uh, uh, as well um, in her question. The breakdown of where reductions have been achieved shows where we might wish to focus efforts to achieve further and faster change and how we will encourage people to change how they act will be embedded in the development of our next emissions reduction plan. So while weather helped to influence people's behaviour in 2014 in terms of using less energy at home, we need to encourage people to continue to make these changes to keep that thermostat turned down uh, again and again and again. Thank you. That brings us to the end of a uh, statement. Can I offer my apologies to the three members who weren't, I wasn't able to invite to speak. I'm afraid we're 12 minutes behind schedule already. Um, and I would just encourage all members to keep their questions short and perhaps ministers to keep their answers short too.